Hi there everyone and welcome to another week of the Good News According to Job. Uh, we, we're well underway into the next cycle of Job and this week we are turning to Job 23 and 24. And as we turn to this section of Job we find Job speaking again uh, and he is now going to give a response to what Eliphaz has, has said in last week's uh, passage that we looked at. And as we turn to Job 23 and 24, I really hope for us today that as we look at it, it stirs you. It uh, gets you to think and feel um, the weight of what Job has to say. Uh, a lot of what he is saying is quite uh, driven by emotion, driven by uh, his heart, driven by his observation, but also how it impacts who he is and what he, how he has lived. And so what I want to do for us is I want to flip uh, this, this section of Job, Job 20, 23 and 24 on its head. And I actually want to do it in reverse. I want to look at, at chapter 24 first and then look at chapter 23 so that we can understand a little bit more why Job is actually saying what he's saying in 24. So by looking at 24, we're going to see a, a weightiness in what he says. And then by turning to 23, we understand why. He is saying what he is saying and how that affects who he is and how he sees himself in light of uh, the God that he serves. And when I say that, it's uh, by contrasting himself within the story or within the pictures that he paints and really reflects on who he is and who God is in light of that. So I want to read for us just chapter 24 uh, just so that you can get a, a feel of the picture that he paints. And we're going to pick up on a few ideas when we're done, and then we're going to turn to 23 and see the little ideas and things that, that he does say that's important to highlight. So listen to these words of Job chapter 24. Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? There are those who move boundary stones. They pasture flocks that they have stolen. They drive away the orphan's donkey and take the widow's ox in pledge. They thrust the needy from the path and force all the poor of the land into hiding. Like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go about their labor of foraging food and the wasteland provides food for their children. They gather fodder in the fields and glean in the vineyards of the wicked. Lacking clothes, they spend the night naked. They have nothing to cover themselves in the cold. They are drenched by mountain rains and hug the rocks for lack of shelter. The fatherless child is snatched from the breast. The infant of the poor is seized for a debt. Lacking clothes, they go about naked. They carry the sheaves, but still go hungry. They crush olives among the terraces. They tread the wine presses, yet suffer thirst. The groans of the dying rise from the city. And the souls of the wounded cry out for help. But God charges no one with wrongdoing. There are those who rebel against the light, who do not know its ways or stay in its paths. When daylight is gone, the murderer rises up, kills the poor and needy, and in the night steals forth like a thief. The eye of the adulterer watches for dusk. He thinks, no eye will see me, and he keeps his face concealed. In the dark, thieves break into houses, but by day they shut themselves in. They want nothing to do with the light. For all of them, midnight is their morning. They make friends with the terrors of darkness. Yet they are foam on the surface of the water. Their portion of the land is cursed, so that no one goes to the vineyards. As heat and drought snatch away the melted snow, so the grave snatches away those who have sinned. And the womb forgets them. The worm feasts on them. The wicked are no longer remembered. 
but the broken are broken like a tree. They prey on the barren and childless woman, and to the widow they show no kindness. But God drags away the mighty by his power. Though they become established, they have no assurance of life. He may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. For a little while they are exalted, and then they are gone. They are brought low and gathered up like all others. They are cut off like heads of grain. If this is not so, who can prove me false and reduce my words to nothing? And so this is the passage that we have here today. Is uh, The reason why I want to look at 24 is 20, verse 20, chapter 24 seems so much uh, like what the friends have been saying. But it's so different. Job paints a picture here as he considers the, the orphan and the widow, the oppressed, the poor, the hungry. He paints this picture of how the, the wicked are benefiting off of the poor. He paints this picture where the, the young, the helpless, the destitute are suffering at the hands of those that are wealthy, those that are powerful. And he uses this picture because it is a picture that was painted for us uh, in many ways by Eliphaz, as well as uh, the previous section where Job had already brought this to our attention in Job 21. If you remember the, the words uh, that were used by Eliphaz last week, he picks up on some of the words that Job had used. You see little things coming to the surface. So if you remember in verse 17 and 18 of 22, it says, They said to God, leave us alone. What can the Almighty do to us? It, it was he who filled their houses with good things. So I stand aloof from the plans of the wicked. And they're picking up on Job's words and playing around with that a bit there. Here Job uses this, phrase, this, this section in chapter 24 to paint this picture all the more. But what's sad is we see how Job paints a deeper picture of what Eliphaz has really painted. Uh, in 22 uh, verse 5 he says, Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? This is what Eliphaz asks Job. And then he paints a really obscure picture of who Job looks like. You demand security from your relatives for no reason. You strip people of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary and you withheld food from the hungry. Though you were pow a powerful man owing land, an honored, uh, honored man living on it. And you sent widows away empty handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. And yet, Job seems to paint the same picture here in chapter 24, where he says, uh, There are those who move boundary stones, living on land that isn't theirs. They pasture flocks they have stolen. They drive away the orphan's donkey and take the widow's ox in pledge. And they thrust the needy from the path and force all the poor of the land into hiding. Why is it then that Job is painting this picture Expanding in many ways the picture that Eliphaz has painted. We see similar ideas as he unpacks in verse 7 of 24. Lacking clothes, they spend the night naked. Or perhaps you picked up on the other wording uh, that they use as he says uh, in verse 10. They, the second half, they carry the sheaves, but still go hungry. And they carry the, the, the content, the, the very thing that can provide them with sustenance. But they do it for labor's sake, but they still are hungry. Or the other side of it, they crush olives among the terraces. Or they tread the wine presses, yet suffer thirst. They don't get to drink of anything that they produce. And it goes deeper 
as he considers those that rebel against the light. Job has been complaining about darkness, that he is feeling like he is shrouded by darkness, that he is hard pressed, that he is suffering. But it is not his friend. And yet in 13 to 17, he paints this picture of those that take comfort and they hide in the dark and how darkness is their morning. So when the night comes, they begin to do things, whether it's murder, steal, commit adultery, break into houses. And then he paints the picture of the wicked, saying that they are like foam on the sea. They, they are of no value. They have no place. They are what the sea rejects. And like foam, as it washes onto the seashore, it eventually just disappears and is forgotten. Or like snow, they melt away. Or the womb forgets them. And so God will deal with the wicked. God will deal with the sinners. As he says in verse 24 of chapter 24, For a little while they are exalted, and then they are gone. They are brought low and gathered up like all others. They are cut off like heads of grain. They are no different to anybody else. They may seem to be exalted. They may seem to get away with what they get away with for a period of time. But at the end they will be judged. So these are heavy words that we hear in chapter 24, but the reason why we look here is otherwise it wouldn't make as much sense. Why Job concludes in verse 25 with these words, if this is not so, who can prove me false and reduce my words to nothing? Job is essentially using a very similar argument to that of Eliphaz. But why does this strengthen his argument? but breaks down uh, breaks down Eliphaz's argument. Well, it lies in the heart of what Job is trying to say. And for us to understand why 24 is so, chapter 24 is so significant to 23, we need to understand the weight of 24 and the intention of 24. And so 24 verse 1 begins in this way, and we need to highlight that again before we turn to 23. It says, Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment. Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? Those that serve him, those that love him, those that cherish him in their hearts, they look for the day of judgment, uh, not for themselves, but they look so to the Almighty for that day when the wickedness that is afflicted upon the world will be judged. And remember, if you remember what we looked at in, in Job 21, is that there is something that will happen to them, but the judgment that awaits them is not according to a time schedule. It doesn't imply that if they do wickedness, then they will suffer immediately. So Job's question here is, why are there not times for judgment? Why is it that the wicked get away with it for a period of time? They shouldn't get away with it at all. And so if you think about this, there, there seems to be this tension created. Job is suffering. Eliphaz is saying that he is suffering because he is wicked. And that he is facing uh, his judgment at the allotted time, in other words. But yet, we know that that's not true. Job isn't suffering because he has sinned, because he is wicked. He's suffering for a different reason. But as Job reflects on the reality of suffering, on the reality of wickedness, on the reality of sinfulness and what will happen, he weighs all of this up. He paints a vivid image of those that get away with it. Job's concern has become the fact that he is suffering for no reason. While those that are doing wicked get away with it for a time. 
So as we turn to chapter 23, hopefully it will kind of flesh itself out to make a little bit more sense of what Job is really saying in chapter 24 here. Listen to what he says in the first or the second verse of Job uh, 23 verse 2. And picture, before we read that picture, Job waking up. It's a new day. He opens his eyes and he says this. Even today, my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. So we know that Job has expressed himself. He has said that he groans. His very soul for that matter groans. And now he says, as if it's a brand new day, he says, even today, my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy on, uh, heavy in spite of my groaning. Despite the fact that Job is groaning, he is still experiencing hardship. He is still suffering. And his complaint is still bitter. Let's look at the next three verses. Verses 3 to 5. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him. Fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me. And consider what he would say to me. And so this is important that we remember this. It's going to help us to, to really see where the this, uh, where this story unfolds and where it takes us. Because in many ways this is going to happen. There is going to be an answer. And we've seen that this ha is Job's longing. He has been longing to hear from God. But it's interesting that he has a confidence in what he is saying here. But the fact that he wants to seek God, he doesn't want to seek the answers of man. He doesn't want to seek that. He wants to seek God. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. But how can he say this? Listen to this. He questions for a moment. Would he vigorous, vigorously oppose me? No. He would not press charges against me. And this is vital. Verse 7. There the upright can establish their innocence before him. And there I would be delivered forever from my judge. Job is saying here that he would seek God out in God's dwelling, find him, argue with God. But he does so not because he is wanting to fight with God. But he does so because he is confident that he has served God. And that because he has served God, he can enter into this argument, if you want to put it that way. That he can enter into this discussion and hear what God has to say to him. There the upright, as he says, can, be, can establish their innocence before him. Job is so convinced that he is not among the wicked. He is not among the wicked that he paints in chapter 24. But when he looks at that picture, when he considers it, it perplexes him. It perplexes him because of his suffering that he faces now while they carry on prospering. Though Job knows that all will be brought down to the grave eventually, it perplexes him that he is suffering. But listen to these words that he says in 8 and 9. And there's a contrast that's created. Verse 8. But if I go to the east... He is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, 
I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. And so we get this picture of Job seeking God. He's looking. He's trying to find God. But he feels as though God is not there. Perhaps we need to pause there and just consider for a moment how this may seem true to us. Perhaps our circumstances are a lot different and the reasons for our sufferings are different to Job's. And they most likely are. But how often is it when we suffer, when we face hardship, we can feel that God is not there. We cry out to him. We plead to him. And for some reason, we feel that we're searching. We search to the east and to the west, to the north and to the south. But he seems not to be there. Obviously, there's different times and different extents of suffering. The times when you suffer in immense hardship, you feel closer to God. But often there's times when you feel you're suffering in a way that God seems absent. And the place that Job finds himself at now, he feels all the more as if God is absent from him. And he seeks. But what's interesting is the contrast that's painted in 23 and 24. Because Job then picks up on this in chapter 24 verse 22. And just notice the type of language that changes a little bit. It says, but God drags away the mighty by his power. Though they have become established, they have no assurance of life. He may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. And this perplexes Job even further. God's eyes on the wicked. But Job, who sees himself as upright, as blameless, feels that God is not looking at him, or that at least he cannot find him. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. He cannot see God. But then there's something reassuring about what he says, and we need to turn to the next three verses to really feel the weight of it. It says, but though I cannot find him, he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. And for us, this is a beautiful picture. Something that we want to almost adopt in our own lives. That we can, we can confess that. A beautiful statement. But this is where his confidence lies. That God knows his ways. That God sees the paths that he takes. And for the first time, Job has given us an indication that he sees this as a test. That all that he is going through is a test that will ultimately produce in him, uh, as he says, I will come forth as gold. He will be purified as gold. He will come out as something of value. He will be valuable at the end of this. But his confidence is that his feet has followed in the Lord's steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. Job has had his heart and his mind set on the Lord. He is confident that he is not suffering because of his wickedness. And as he weighs up all of these things, he is perplexed by the fact that yet he suffers, but that he will be refined. He will be 
uh, he will become better than what he is. Let's look at those last couple verses there from verse 13. But he stands alone and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his decrees against me. And many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him when I think of all of this. I fear him. And God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. Job expresses the depth of his suffering, the depths of this hardship that he is facing. And he recognizes that he can't oppose God. His intention is not to oppose God. As we heard early on, he, he wants to argue. He wants to hear. He wants to get an answer from God. But his heart's desire is not to oppose God. In actual fact, he is willingly aware of the fact that more hardship may come. And that terrifies him. But even though it terrifies him, there is a certainty that he will come out uh, like gold at the end. Notice verse 16. He says, God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. I'm terrified of what he has permitted, what he has allowed to happen in my life. But what's beautiful is verse 17. Even though I'm terrified, even though my heart is faint, he says, yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. I am not silenced by this. When I consider who God is, when I seek Him, when I long to argue with Him, even though He terrifies me, and what He has allowed to happen to me terrifies me because of His plan and His purpose. I'm not silenced. I'm not silenced. I'm not quiet. I will speak. I want to speak. I want to come before God. I want to come to his dwelling place. I want to ask him questions. And then we have this section in 24 that then paints that picture. And what it does is it creates this contrast that Job is someone that's seeking God, that's not silenced by his afflictions, that's wanting to run to God and talk to him and argue with him and, and know who he is and why, why this has happened to him. Where you have this picture in chapter 24 of the wicked that want nothing to do with God. Like we read earlier, the words echoed of Job, echoed by Eliphaz in verse 17 of chapter 22. They said to God, leave us alone. What can the Almighty do to us? Job sits terrified and yet he wants to talk to God. He wants to know God. He wants to run to God. He wants to find God. His path leads to God. And so he reflects on this wickedness, as well as the contrast in that, in chapter 24, of the wickedness versus those that are oppressed and cannot fend for themselves. And he says, this is a reality. God, you judge all of these things in your time. It would be great if we knew when all of this would take place. But yet, we find ourselves, as he says in verse 1b, Why must those who know you, him, look in vain for such days? When we look at the wicked, when we see the things happening around us, we look to you in vain, it seems, for when that judgment will come, because this, this world is so painful. And this sounds like something that we find 
in the New Testament that we find in Jesus Christ. He enters the world and he tells us not only of his ministry and, and what he has set out to do, but he sets out to restore the broken, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, and to bring judgment on the wicked. But the time, when that will happen, how that will unfold, is up to him. We don't have the details. We don't know the inner workings. And yet we are sitting in this world, at times petrified. Like Job. Petrified of the fact that things happen. God permits many things to happen. But can we continue to call out to him? Can we continue to say what Job has said in 10 to 12? That he knows my way that I take. And he has tested me. I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I've kept his way without turning aside. I've not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Can we say that in light of Jesus Christ? And hold on to it until Christ returns. Until the final judgment, no matter when that is, and no matter how corrupt and how terrible the world may seem around us, and how hard pressed and how much we may suffer, can we hold on to the fact that the path that Christ has laid out is a perfect path? This world may look confusing in our human eyes, but the wisdom of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, is perfect. And that when the time comes, we will be restored. We will come forth as gold. Well, I hope that Job 23 and 24 is good news for you this, today. And that as you wrestle through it, that you find that Jesus truly is the answer to this perplexing world that we live in and that it may restore your hope in the midst of suffering to hold on to persevere to not be silenced despite the hardships despite the terrors despite the uncertainties but that you can certainly hold on to the certainty of Christ have a great day and we'll see you in here next week. Cheers, bye.